If you haven't been down yet to 1285 Avenue of the Americas to see the exhibition, To Be a Lady, 45 Women in the Arts, you have a treat in store for you. It's right in our backyard, so you shouldn't miss it. It includes some of the giants of the last century, Louise Nevelson, Alice Neal, Lee Bontecu, as well as some of the emerging voices from women in the visual arts. Tonight's program builds on that exhibition and extends some of the themes. It brings together a choreographer, scholars, painters, a fabric artist, to discuss the contemporary state of the arts for women, the barriers that still exist for them, and perhaps the opportunities for more collaborations. Tonight's moderator, Jason Andrew, curated the exhibit and will moderate the panel. He spoke here last year to an enthusiastic audience about Jack Torkoff at Black Mountain College. Jason is the manager of the Torkoff estate. An independent curator, archivist, and producer, he co-founded the nonprofit Norte Mar in 2004 with panelist Julia Gleitch. The organizing force behind To Be a Lady, Norte Mar aims to promote and present collaborations among those working in the visual, literary, and performing arts, and to help such artists discover venues of opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Jason Andrew and the panelists. Thank you, Pam. It's great to, great to be back. Um, I wanted to welcome my panelists coming out tonight to hear, be here with me. My, again, my name is Jason Andrew, and I'm the co-founder and director of Norte Mar. Um, I'm also an independent curator with uh, lots of different kinds of ideas and interests in all kinds of different arts, uh, visual, literary, and performing arts. And um, as Pam uh, mentioned, I curated the To Be a Lady, 45 Women in the Arts, which is currently on view at the 1285 Avenue of the Americas Gallery. Um, I'd like to thank Pam and the Art Students League for having us tonight, and I'm very pleased to introduce the panelists, Go, starting with Julia from left, from your right to left, Julia starts, a noted choreographer on faculty of Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance, London, and, and is also the head of choreography at the London Studio Center. Her choreography brings gap, bridges gaps between the traditional ballet and conceptuality of the postmodern dance. Ms. Gleick is also the core fa my co-founder and president of Norte Mar. And she recently curated a new series featuring women choreographers working with the Point Shoe, and that was called Counterpoint. She has a new video work titled The Decker Fall at the To Be a Lady exhibition. And to her left is Tamara Gonzalez, who pushes paint to the optical extreme. Actually, can we? I forgot my slides. There's Julia. Yay! And here's Tamara pushing paint to op optical extreme through her unique process of spray paint through found lace tablecloths, doilies, and curtains. Vibrant and witty, layered and textured, she combines large gesture with tight patterns that w at once mimic the grand heroic gestures of the post-war painters while capturing an all-over free spirit found in graffiti that appears daily on the streets near her Bushwick studio. And this is her painting, Plastic Fantastic, which is on, on exhibition. Brees Honeycutt is a fabric artist. The next slide. This is actually a detail of her very large installation. It's 120 inches by 60 inches. She's a fabric artist and sculptor who doodles with yarn and sketches with needle and thread. Her use of traditional forms, weaving, knitting, sewing, and stitching may at first seem crafty, but there's always something more sinister, more undecided in her work, which suggests other ideas about the human condition. Next slide, please. Lindsay Walt is a painter interested in the ornamental arts, beading, lace work, as well as Isla Islamic tiles and children's string games. These all come to mind when interacting with her paintings. A modern impressionist, she paints spidery lines and tiny dots that form elaborate configurations that seem to call into play universal elements. Um, again, I apologize for the slides. You have to see this painting in person. It's called Pile, and it's in, included in the, uh, the To Be a Lady exhibition. 
Amy Whittaker is a scholar who teaches and writes about the intersection of art and business and the everyday life. She has worked for museums including the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art, as well as for the artist Jenny Holzer. She's the author of Museum Legs, Fatigue and Hope in the Face of Art, a collection of essays about the creative life of museums and, the pub and a public life. She's also a full-time faculty member at Sotheby's Institute. And the last panelist is Anne Schwartz, a, a, a professor of art history at Savannah College of Art and Design. In her writing, curating, and public lectures, she focuses on contemporary art, specifically feminist artists and critical theory. Her main focus has been on the advancement and the has been to advance innovation and transgressive work of both emerging and established artists whose art has not been fully examined. The next slide, please. So thank you all for being here tonight, and I'm going to actually join you because it seems a little strange that a man directing a panel about women is hovering over you. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought um, what I would do is I would like to do um, is, is just read an excerpt from uh, the essay that accompanies the exhibition. For centuries, the word the lady has been a nuanced term for women prescribed by social mores. Politeness, good manners, correct attire, and behaving properly shaped what it meant to be a lady. To be considered as such was once the goal of every woman across every economic spectrum. At least that's what the men thought. Despite what we might appear to be great progress for women, in the arts, these societal expectations continue into the present, impeding recognition. So why another exhibition, another panel about the ladies? Because we still have to deal with this. Next slide. The binder of women. <laughs> and, because, and, and because despite great progress, we still have a lot of ground to make up. Visages of another time still remain. For women in the arts, as, as in many other fields, a special fortitude and commitment can be seen in the work and lives of those who succeed. And I'm honored to be here in the company of many great ladies, both here on the panel and in the audience. Um, we can go to the next slide. Just, we, we have to refresh ourselves now. <laughs> Lee Krasner said, I'm an artist, not a woman artist. Grace Hartigan said, I was never conscious of being a female artist. I resented being called a woman artist. I'm an artist. Then actually, I don't even like being called an artist anymore. I'm a painter. <laughs> so um, that leads me into the first topic, which is sort of just a general, um, uh, sort of out for a general discussion. And that is, so how do you feel about a show singling you out as a woman? And um, do you think this ghettoizes uh, women artists? I think that would probably be mostly directed to the artists. In the Who goes first? Okay. Um, I had both reactions. Um, the first was um, not so much that the show was comprised of women artists, but that we were actually saying it. There's been a spate of, of shows in New York that were all women artists, but nobody was actually putting that up front. It was just a painting show, or this show, or that show. Um, and then I went full circle and was like, you know, with, with, with it striking that note in me, I guess made me intrigued, you know, that I was to have that reaction and um, you know the show is amazing. Um, Thank it's an amazing you. group of artists. You know, and yeah, you know. I think the word lady. I was like, well, where's the lords? You know, but um, <laughs> I saw the big pink sign hanging on Sixth Avenue, and I was in love <laughs> in the UBS lobby. <laughs> so. Does anyone else want to comment on that? I worked for an artist for a long time that never would have, it was a, a woman artist that never would have been in an all-female show. And when, but I think it's still relevant because Gagosian uh, and only one gallery in 2012 and one of his 12 um, 
galleries worldwide had a, a female. Mm -hmm. So it's still relevant, and women are making work. So I think it's great to celebrate women, yeah. or ladies, shall we say. <laughs> so I encamp, oh, do you want? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see, I come from the epitome of female ghettos, which is the ballet world. And so, you know, I, it, I've been in countless programs where it's all women choreographers or all women performers that you'll be in a show that there are no men at all. But of course that's at a certain level. And then as soon as you go to another level, it's mo mainly women performing, but always the man, always. I'm going to give you some statistics later. Uh, almost always the man directing. So, uh, you know, to me it's kind of doesn't doesn't really matter to me in a way personally whether I'm in a a show that's mixed sex or that's all ladies. But also I had a little insight into the sort of ideas behind Jason's thinking about the meaning of lady. So I think that I liked the, the sort of straw man situation that he was putting out there. The, um, the material, when I, was, when I was trying to develop this show, there were two ideas that, I, that actually I was trying, that, or theories, the overall theories that I encountered and wanted to sort of pursue with the lady show. And um, I want to see if I can get Anne to, Anne Schwartz to ring in on this one. Linda Nochlin suggested that women artists are, quote, more inward looking, more delicate and nuanced in their treatment of the medium. And that was something that, um, that was just a, something that kept ringing up in my mind because everyone that I have chosen for this show and the women that I work with outside of doing just this show, the material has a lot to do with it. But I, I wonder if there's some truth in that statement and how much you agree with that or disagree with that idea. Um, <clears throat> I don't think Nachlin even agrees with it. Because yeah. in, the, excuse me, in the essay, um, she says, uh, uh, which of the artists that she's talking about could be regarded as more inward turning than Radon, more subtle and nuanced in the handling of pigment than Corot. And um, uh, I think she was putting it out there and then pulling back at the same time. I don't think mm -hmm. she agreed with it. And mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say something about the lady title. When I first saw the title of the show, I was immediately f reminded, and I had a instant visual flash on the cover of Marilyn French's book, um, The Woman's Room, where lady is crossed out. And in my education as a feminist, um, lady has really been a disparaged term mm -hmm. because it has all the connotations of submission, suppression, oppression, and so it's not something celebrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I thought about that when I was coming up with the title, but first of all, the most important thing for me was to be pro provocative. I was not going to shy away from the idea that this is what, how the show came about. Just a, just a couple of, just to let you into my curatorial mind, when I was developing this show, I show a lot of artists who happen to be women. And so this wasn't a real stretch for me. Um, but coming up with a way of situating it so that it could be attentive to all these various mediums that artists are working with and, and to develop this sort of an, uh, societal and actually political kind of uh, show, um, uh, it wasn't my direct intention. But I also think the title has a question, what does it mean now to be a lady? And that kind of leads me to the next, uh, next sort of question that I had about um, women making work today and Eleanor Monroe suggested that women do not feel that they need to quote break with their past to become herself as it seems. The creative male is impelled to overthrow his father and sim symbolically reject his art. Um, again Anne, I, I wanted to bring you in on this because you have, you're more of a historian in this area than I am. But it seems to me, especially when I'm looking and I was putting together this show, that the works from the historic period to the mid-career artists to the younger generation or these emerging artists, we'll call them, um, they all seem to build onto one another. And you can find and you can see uh, things that people were, that the, the artists who happened to be women were looking at each other's work maybe, or even just you can see that there wasn't this total disregard to that. I think that actually adds to the flow of the exhibition when you walk through it. One, one bay leads to the next bay, leads to the next bay, and you can feel the continuity. So I wonder about, that. that's one of the questions I had is about, do you think that that's a, a true statement? I mean, or is that? Well, I think um, 
Monroe's book is really important. It has a few quirks to it, and yeah. that's this is this whole discussion is one of them. Um, uh, she disregards uh, the mother-daughter relationship, which, uh -huh. in the history of women artists, feminist art, feminist artists. Um, in terms of organizing, the biggest problem has been the mother-daughter relationship. Even today, the second wave, the third wave, and now the burgeoning next kind of group, it's, it's a tension between how do I respond to what came before, how do I react against it, and um, all the kinds of terms that are usually associated with masculine, um, masculinization of art, exist in your show for me. Um, there's confrontation, there's virility, there's domination, but uh, it's interpreted differently just because this particular group of artists is interpreted differently. And I just wanted to say something about your initial question that you asked the artist about uh, ghettoizing. And it occurred to me that um, your show is really close to the Museum of Modern Art in geographical location and distance. and. Um, when the Museum of Modern Art did the WAC show, they did it at PS1. So that's quite a distance from 53rd, 5th, and 6th. And um, the curators at MoMA decided to have a series of feminist exhibitions on view. And um, Mira Shore wrote that uh, they were engaging in a kind of stealth feminism that they weren't really willing to say, this is what we're doing. Another critic wrote about the WAC show, this is the only woman art show that we're probably going to see at MoMA for the next decade. Mm -hmm. So it's significant in terms of real estate that your show is located where it is. Sixth Avenue, you know, having signage, having the artist names, it's extremely important. And for these artists, it, I think it will affect their market. I think it will affect the curatorial attention they'll receive, critical attention. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's very significant. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, thank you for that, and I, I, I agree with you completely. I also, I also feel like I'm sort of tired of the whole institutionalized, sort of this institutionalization of how you can interpret and and promote work through museums. But that's a whole other. I don't want to get off on a tangent. But I would like to return to materials. Oh, do you have something? Do you want to? Say? Oh, I just um, you were you were talking about uh, Linda Nochlin and. Uh, I was thinking about her wonderful essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And I, I know I'm here as a kind of representative of the marketplace. I teach business to people in the arts, but I also uh, teach the market economy to a classroom that's 90% women. And in a way, I often feel like a big part of my job is inviting them into conversation and giving my students the language uh, to understand what their friends do who work in finance and to be part of a conversation. So I often feel like when there's a, a decision to have an art show that's specifically women, um, there, there can be two different kind of impetuses, if that is the, were the word. And one is to make the work visible, and the other is to create a conversational space. And it, it seems like both of those things happened, um, that often um, in the Linda Nochlin sense, uh, I think she was in one way saying that it wasn't that there hadn't been any great women artists is that you couldn't imagine where they were because they hadn't been made visible. They weren't trained or they didn't have the ability to show up and I think you would have seen the same thing happen on the finance side when Larry Summers did or did not say what he might have said about women in science and math. And so you see a lot of different uh, initiatives across areas inside and outside of the arts. For example, Girls Who Code, a, a new um, kind of startup nonprofit that creates a community in which girls can learn to do computer programming, girls being a word that's as fraught as lady. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it, the argument there is that um, women don't learn to code in part because they feel uncomfortable being the one woman in the computer programming classroom. And so they're trying to deal with that as well. So I feel like there's I, I can completely understand the the pendulum swing of, oh no, I don't want to be in a show that's just women artists, and actually this is sort of wonderful. Um, and I think it's partly creating a conversation around the work, and it's yeah. partly a, a kind of how, how people learn and, and converse, as you know, whether as a monologue or in, in, a, in a more collaborative way. I mean, one of the challenges, I just want to touch on one quick thing about the history thing. I mean, you never, you never hear a man, you never hear about, you never see a reader review of a, 
of a, of a, let's just say, a male artist and saying, oh wow, how great and it is and how strong it is, it relates this way to Louise Bourgeois. You never, I mean, there's this whole, you know, there's, no, there's never historical connotation. Women and their work seems to be put in a place and it's kept there. And when, like what Anne said, it's ready to be brought out, we'll do a show, but not, at, not in Midtown Manhattan, not in this flagship show. We'll do something outside the city so it can have a more alternative sense to its feel to it. I want to get to, to the materials and how uh, I think, and I wonder, I wanted to ask the artists on the panel about materials and how it might um, how it might classify you as a women's of the woman's artist, Lindsay. Your work um, exists as a meditation on space, ethereal and sensual. And to me, it's it's gen it's not gender specific, specific. However, I mean, anyone who's creating creating work, no matter what gender it is, um, it becomes a co complicated process when you try when you do something as serene and as delicate as the kind of wake work that you make. Do you want to do you, you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I actually wanted to, to talk about um, affirmative action okay. because... Uh, <laughs> sure, <laughs> we could talk about that. Well, I, I mean, I, I felt by being included in the show and what you were doing was really a form of affirm affirmative action of which I actually support. And I think particularly with the election coming up, it is an issue that has come into my mind quite a bit. And apropos of that, on the way, I was out in the country this weekend and stopped in Seneca Falls, mm. which was really the birthplace of the women's movement in the United States in 1848. I, and we did not get the vote until the First World War. So I was, to me, it was, I, I was thinking about all of this as I was trying to prepare for the panel, um, like, what am I going to say? And I thought, well, a lot of things haven't changed. Um, but none of the, the things that you've done within the show would have worked unless the work was really good and strong. Of course, I'm in the show, so I'm biased. But <laughs> I do think that um, the one thing I would say about my own work and a, a lot of other people who are in the show in terms of materials is that the influences that I look at, many of them are considered women's work, like beading, embroidery, filigree, things that have more to do with decorative art and it hasn't ever, well it has, it's been accepted as being an influence on, on many male artists, you know, Alan Shields used it, I mean, Jim Hodges used it, there are many artists who use decorative elements, but when women use it, it's considered like a feminine idea. And I just want to, to say that I, I think it's really much more of a universal idea, mm. so. Yeah. Um, Brice, you're kind of in the same position in a way, in that, I mean, much of your work itself is geared towards the materials and the processes, and, and, and the processes that you're using can easily be defined as traditional, and with the weaving and the knitting, and so how do you, how do you feel about that? I well, mean, I, I think about it a lot. I'll just go back. When I was in college, I was an art history major, and I um, had been weaving and doing a lot of funky materials, and I decided to m convince the male tenured faculty to do a neon. I want to do a neon, and so I did this independent study. And in one of the crits, he said to me, real sculpture is made of steel. <laughs> and for 20 years in my studio, I kept hearing, real sculpture is made of steel, and I didn't use the funky materials, although I did work about women and I used steel and slate and copper and wood. And then I project in it funded and I'd been using a lot of wool and I started using it again. And it was sort of, I don't know, I was like, <gasps> you know, feminine versus feminist, you know, does materials gender identification? But I, I don't know, there's something beautiful about the materials, w yeah. w women's work and it, it was a challenge for inner, an inner challenge. Not, nobody mm -hmm. was telling me, you, you know, in the art world I couldn't use it. It was just me sitting there going, real sculptures made of steel. <laughs> Tamara, your use of spray paint and, and lace, I mean, it combines this muscle and manners. And um, I mean, do you feel, how do you feel about when, you, when you're making work and... Um. Well, when I first used a piece of lace, um, Judy Pfaff is also in this show, 
<laughs> and um, I love her work. And I had repaired a canvas with a doily. I, I instantly thought of Judy. And I was like, okay, well, that's great. I'll leave that there, but I've got to use this differently. I have to build on this. And it was soon after I started using the lace as stencils. And while I was doing it, the first artist I was um, thinking of that came to mind was Chris Wool, Philip Taft, um, Rudolf Stingel, Mark Flood. These are all artists that are, you know, doing relatively well with their careers, and they they were using lace, so or, or decorative patterning. Um, so my concerns were to sort of. Def, you know, they were more about defining my own use of the material. And so there was never a moment where I thought, oh, it's too feminine. Too pretty. Or too pretty. No, I was, too pretty. I was delighted I was making something pretty. I, I tend to make a lot of rather garish work. Um, you know, that said, I, I just want to make a pitch with, um, especially in art, I feel like when we talk about gender and materials that like, there may be some um, some things that look that we, we define as either feminine or masculine, but you know, it goes. It, it's not gender specific in a sense that um, you know, I might be a male. You know, one might be a male painter channeling a feminine side of themselves. Yeah. As much as um, a female painter cha channeling a more masculine. Yeah. Traditionally masculine energy, and, and just to keep that in mind. And yeah, um, so. when you when you asked the question of the artist about materials, I was reminded of walking through the show um, when we got to the May Wilson piece. I just flashed on. There's a new book about Bruce Connor, and if you look at the trajectories of their respective and very different careers, the thing that recurred to me is that. Um, women's use of materials, even if it's almost parallel with what a male artist is doing, is usually regarded as eccentric and not in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, Mae Wilson's been kind of marginalized by comparison to Bruce Connor, and there are others in the show. Uh, Nancy Grossman um, has made a work called Male Figure Sculpture. Yes. It was just on view at the Tang a few um, months ago. And For those I, of you who don't know it, it's a, it's a very large figure covered in one of the leather pieces that she's done. It's in it's, Jerusalem, it's, so it, it's amazing piece. It doesn't come to the United States. And it should be an icon. I mean it exactly. should be one of the great icons, post war icons. It, it should be one of the major works of the twenty second half of the twentieth century and you know, probably only maybe five people in here have seen a reproduction of it. Maybe a few. But we've all you, seen you know. Maplethorpe's leather. <laughs> we've all seen Maplethorpe's and Maplethorpe leather. And Maplethorpe and Grossman were very close. Uh -huh. So anyway, it just yeah. I think that the material discussion is, is funny because there's this whole vocabulary around the way women do it that's very different from what men do. But I want to I want to sneak Julia in on here because um, the point shoe is usually um, let's talk about the point shoe just really quickly. It's you know. If a woman uses the point shoe, it's done correctly. It's usually done correctly. But if a man wears a pair of point shoes, or choreographs on a man using it differently, how does how does that actually? Let me say this first. I, you know, I'm listening and I'm getting an education um, about materials and 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 things in the visual art world that I'm not maybe so um, exposed to, or I don't have as much knowledge. And I'm looking for parallels all the time. And there are lots of differences and lots of similarities. Um, but, um, but partly, I think, because the form is ephemeral, because it disappears, you know, after it's performed. Sure, you have the video, but the experience Like the ballet. The, the ballet, ballet. Yeah, yeah, ballet performance. You know, you see it, and then it's gone. And it's a little harder, I think, to talk about the work in a concrete way. It's very difficult to describe a dance. It's the first thing that I teach my choreography students to do, because they, the words they use are always judgmental. Or their uh, descriptions by comparing them to historical um, choreographers, which of course are always men. Um, but to go to the point shoe, you know, we have a whole other layer of issues because, you know, typically women wear point shoes and men don't. There was a period in history where we kind of pushed men right out of ballet and then of course they came back and now they're in the leadership roles. But um, when I was curating this exhibition, this um, uh, performance, uh, the question came up, uh, Julia, are, are you okay with me doing a work for a man on point? And of course I'm always, up, you know, yeah, sure, but maybe not for this show. 
because I felt a little bit like it was sending up the very thing that we were trying to go into with more depth. That it was creating something incredibly superficial that would immediately have high entertainment value, but for no other reason than it played on sex. And nothing, you know, it didn't, it might have had depth. She might have done a work that had a lot of depth. Um, but I wasn't, I decided that I wasn't willing to take that risk at this point, that that's maybe for a later stage in the process. But it also undermines then all the other women's. Um, sense of responsibility towards furthering the form. Because historically, especially in England, you know, the men always dress up and they put a dress on and everybody goes, oh, they're so funny, it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> what does a woman do in dance? What can a woman do that will immediately evoke that kind of response? They're so clever. Oh, how brave they are, how exciting. There's, there's almost nothing we can do. Carol Armitage did it when she, the punk ballerina, when she played heavy, loud punk music. Am I doing that? No. Um, to, and then perform some works on point. But there hasn't been a lot else that would shock or arouse like that. I can't remember the choreographer's name. She did a whole performance where all the performers were naked um, last year and it was, uh, it was treated as performance art instead of dance, even though she conceived it as dance. You're, you're, well, you're, not, you're not talking about Marina Abramovich, you're not talking about... Yeah. Um, you know, but see, nudity again is one of those things. It's like you put it on the stage and it immediately titillates. And it's real difficult. I, 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 it's very difficult for me to weigh that up against other approaches to the form. So it just lives in its own category. Spe speaking of nudity, I hate to move on. We're gonna move. Can I have the next slide? I think we all remember this. Do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Um, so this was, I think, late 80s, um, and then I've given you the update. It's now less than 5% of the artists are in the... So we've gone up 1%, um, and 85 nudes are female. Um, let's go to the women in the marketplace. Christie's post-war and contemporary evening sale that just occurred in May netted $388 million. It was the highest total ever by an auction house. And I think few, I think, um, uh, few seem to notice that the auction was also unpre unprecedented in another way. There were 10 lots by eight women artists, and that amounted to a male to female ratio of five to one, which is 20% women. Um, that was unprecedented. And, uh, but another sort of funny statistic here is that uh, yet the proceeds of all the works of the women artists in the Christie's sale tallied a mere 17 million dollars and that was less than five percent of the total and, and not even half the price achieved by one single, one single picture by Eves Klein featuring two naked women. Um, can I have the, the next slide? I'm hard, sorry to get a little statistic on you, but I think we should kind of get a visual picture, help, help us get sort of a, a market picture here. The highest pri price paid for a living artist, Candy Nolan, 6.6 .6 million, and of course the Gerhard Richter that just came up at auction for 34.2 million. These are by living artists. And the next group of numbers are by non-living artists, Louise Bourgeois and the Edward Munch, Scream, I and mean, these are public auctions, not the private backroom sales. Um, Cezanne still has the, the, the world record for the backroom sale of something like $340 million. Um, let's go on to one more, the next slide. According to the 211 poll, by the Pew Research Center, 77% of Americans now believe that a college education is necessary for a woman to get ahead, while 68% think that, it's, that, men, that it, it is true for men, that they need to get an education in order to get ahead. Um, the other statistic I think is really interesting is that 61.4% of the visual art and performing students are women. And, um, so you think that there at least there would be some equality in the galleries and museums if we go to the right there below the brainstormers top offenders of 2010 27 percent of the highest percentage of women were represented by a single gallery and the lowest was four percent if we can go to the next slide 
And I just did a quick survey of the 2012 galleries in New York City. 35% was the highest gallery that represented a, a percentage of women in their stable and 4% was the lowest. I mean, we do have to recognize and I think understand that it's, it's the art market has changed from the 1950s, that galleries don't usually have a stable of artists that they continually represent, but there are those flagship galleries that do, and that's what those uh, statistics reflect. So 22% is the approx approximately the average of women represented in New York City galleries, and of course we can, com we can compare that to 17% of women who hold seats in Congress. Amy, <laughs> putting you on the spot. You had a fascinating chapter in your book, Museum Legs, about the pay of the art world workers and um, MoMA's strike in 2000. We all can agree about the systemic low pay for women's, uh, of women, and not, it's not only universally agreed, but in, um, it becomes a very specific, big problem for women in the arts. Um, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> this is really fascinating to see all the statistics that you put up and I just want to loop back to them in answering your question. So I think that the sales by women artists at auction are a lagging indicator, right? You have to be pretty far into your career. It's a bit like reading the obituaries in the New York Times. I have a friend, Audrey, who reads them and every once in a while she'll send me, as she did last week, a briefing where there were three men who were in these kind of like, you know, expected careers, uh, and then the fourth was the one woman who had a career in softcore porn. And I think you'll often see um, many more men than women in the obituaries, and that, and, and they're, they're great exceptions. I refer you to Marguerite Fox's obituary about, I think her name is Jane Scott, the music critic from the Cleveland Plain Dealer who was described as a, as a, a dash of pink polyester and a sea of black leather and denim. I mean, there, there are definitely people, but we're in the world of exceptionalism because we're looking backwards, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the more operative question is what's happening now and how do you make sense of what's happening now? And Jason raises a, an important point about the, the kind of economic reality of, of women's work. Um, and I don't know about you all, I've been following this conversation that's been playing out in the Atlantic over the past year or two, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter's article about can women really have it all, uh, Kate Bollock's piece about being 39 and not married, uh, and how, how does she make sense of that relative to her work. And I think that uh, even more recently, Hannah Rosen has this book that came out called The End of Men, which I'm still making my way through. And there was a really interesting piece in the New York Times about two weeks ago by Stephanie Kuntz, um, sort of taking on some of these books. Uh, Hannah Rosen says that you know, we live in a resurgent matriarchy because there are women in the middle classes who are out earning their husbands and, and it is true that there are many more women who are the breadwinners than there were in the 70s. I think it's 35% instead of 4%. But at the same time, these are real difficult, um, unanswerable questions or they're questions where there's a half of the decision that you can measure and a half of the decision you can't measure at all and the half you can't measure at all is usually the more important part. Um, and so I, I think that one of the problems, just to answer your question directly and briefly, one of the problems about pay and the arts is that it, in museums it was based historically on the, the fact that many people didn't have to work to make a living and then somehow it migrated into um, work that a lot of women were doing where they were part of a financial ecosystem but not the primary breadwinner and f so people were able to be paid less than a living wage uh, for, for that reason and I, I know some people who lived off of the less than a living wage because they were very resourceful and committed but I know a lot of people who don't work in the arts anymore because um, they needed a small amount more to make it work and I think for women artists and I, I'm actually trained originally as a painter um, for women artists um, there's that question that's your own personal financial ecosystem of how do you manage the day job versus the creative job and then if you put a third 
wheel of family into that as well, I think it gets really complicated. I mean, it's complicated enough for people who are working a day job and having a family life. And if you need not even just the time, but the time-space continuum of making creative work in addition to that, it's, it's very difficult. So I think it's, I don't have a magic silver bullet answer so much as an acknowledgement of the importance of, of raising those questions. I, I think just to sort of put a, a period at the end of what you said, um, there's a really great quote that um, Iwan Worth um, recently said. He said that women artists are the bargains of our time. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big time New York, London dealer. Um, I am also want to remember a, a conversation I had with the late Elizabeth Murray. Um, I just, I don't remember how the conversation led to this, but I just remember her saying to me, and sa if you don't make over a million dollars at auction, you're nobody. And she kind of went like that. You're nobody. It just kind of waved it away. But, you know, money is a powerful tool and, you know, it's the symbol of our, of cultural worth. Um, I think that artists that, that challenge themselves with materials, um, it's harder to market that. It's very hard to market that. Um, uh, a traditional forms of, of art making, they're harder to market. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I once attended a panel with a female gallerist and she said she stopped really showing women because A, they didn't make enough money, I mean her, the work didn't make enough money, but also they hit a certain point where they stopped making the work and she couldn't rely on the product and she really needed the product, she really needed artwork and so yeah. I was appalled by that because most women artists I know work. I mean, they yeah. have lots of work. Well, you don't, you but don't, the, the, money. the figure, the, money. The, 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 when we think of who is, the, if you think of the, uh, an image of the most, of a successful artist in the um, art world, you don't think of a middle-aged mother. I mean, you just don't. I mean, it's very, very hard to juggle being an artist, having a family. Um, so, you know, it's the, the whole, I guess it's our whole perception about those things and keeping an open mind to those ideas. I mean, the, the ladies show that I curated could be done a thousand different ways, a hundred times different in, in different carnations. There are lots and lots and lots of amazing artists. And um, so I think, I think, I don't know what the solution is there. I mean, I think that people continue to collect work and market work. There are certainly those dealers out there that try to promote those things. Um, I just wanted to say one thing because I know in my small way when I'm buying work I really try to support, I'll, I'll err on the side of supporting women artists for this very financial reason. I, mean, I can't do, I can't affect the, the top but um, it's like anything else if, if I was ever given the platform as a collector you and I would make it my point to do that. Maybe it is a type of affirmative action because there's lots of art. No, but to really, yeah. you know, sometimes you just have these blinders on. But if I had to make a choice, that would weigh. Holland in my Cotter choice. wrote a really great op-ed yeah. to the Edward Monk. I don't know if you guys remember yeah. reading that, but he was hilarious about what he would what he would do instead of spending 120 million dollars. And one of the big paragraphs was about collecting. He could put together an amazing, cohesive you know, major collection of women's art with even a third of that much money. It was really quite um, amazing. I just wanted to riff off of something that Amy <coughs> said. Uh, one of the, she was talking about the lagging uh, numbers. And one of the problems women artists have had is that they frequently, um, uh, detractors frequently say, well, they aren't represented in museums. You know. Uh, uh, they're only 4% in the Tate, they're only 5% in the Met, and so on and so on. And that is pointed to as a way of saying there's no quality. Even though what's happened is in the last um, 40 years, as women have become art historians, college professors, curators, critics, we've seen a kind of engagement because many women take on the task of supporting other women as a kind of activist approach to their practice. 
That's a really good point. Lindsay, I think you want to... We had a great conversation about this in your studio. Well, uh, apropos of Elizabeth Murray, she actually came to the Art Institute when I was there, and, and her, her point was also that women had to mentor each other, and that the role models of women had to be such that um, you supported other women as a teacher, um, as a friend, and as a colleague. And I know that myself, it, it just so happens that most of my favorite artists are women. Um, and I have some of my favorite <laughs> artists are women, too, so that's okay. It's our health group, right? It's the support right, group right, right here. <laughs> and, and I have a community of friends who happen to be great artists, and they're women, and we we actually support each other in the studio. So even though we don't have the economic or the power to uh, make changes immediately, I think that little by little, the changes will come about because we're, we're greater in numbers. And you were, you were also mentioning in the studio, which I thought was kind of interesting, I'm glad we were able to kind of work this in, is that you had a statistic about more women graduating from like medical school and Well, women, things. there are more women, I, I have a daughter who just started college, and there are more women who go to college. There are more women who are in law school. Um, th there are not more women who are in engineering or in, in the, the kind of hard science, the math and the computer, and it might be that the language is such that computer language was written by men, and that can change. So there is a group of, I actually know a, a young woman who's an engineer who's encouraging young women to go into engineering, computer science, but I do think that mentoring is very, very important in the arts and in any other job, and that there is a ceiling that you do reach. I mean, I, I have a daughter, and I expect her to have every opportunity that she wants, but I know that, in fact, the pay for women for any job that you do is less than men. And if you have a child in the article that we, we both read, if you have a child, your, your likelihood when you are interviewed for a job is the likelihood is that you will not get a call back on that job. So the yeah. statistics are grim, but I'm hoping that they will change as education and as economic power comes about. Because yeah. I think it does come down to the, it comes down to the dollar, you know, to the filthy lucre in the end, yeah. so. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I just wanted, I, I think we probably all on the panel feel this way, I just wanted to put in a small word for, for men and, and the fact that uh, I think there are a lot of men who um, consciously or unconsciously are great mentors to women. I know someone who is not a feminist at all who set up a playpen in a science lab. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. Uh, set up a playpen in a science lab in the 60s because he wanted women to be able to come to work and do the lab experiments because they were just really good and their kids needed to go somewhere. And I, I see a lot of um, examples of that and I, I also want to say that it's a far broader economic problem about the design of working life. I know men who have to miss their children's um, parent-teacher conferences because they have to go on a work trip because they are the breadwinner and that's the deal and I think that that's a problem too. So I think that the problem is like if, if I work eight hours a day and you're willing to work eight hours and five minutes you get the job and then someone else is willing to work eight hours and ten minutes and then all of a sudden it, the system doesn't work. So I think it's, it's much more um, cultural and ingrained. I, I couldn't agree more about women supporting other women, but I also think someone like Jason, I'm just going to throw this out for you, it'd be great if you wanted to be a gallerist to um, inadvertently champion the work of women while simply bringing work of merit. To, to the marketplace. And I, yeah. I think it's also just that a lot of people who are good at art are not good at self-promotion, and yeah. maybe that falls on women, especially given the structure of the conversation. Yeah, I think that the inequality is, is not only, well, I mean, the major, the rooted problem here is the lack of opportunity and representation. I think when women are given the opportunity, they can, they're, but those opportunities are so far and rare and far in between. Okay. Just, just so I wanted quickly, to introduce. Just quickly, I would, I would add that we're, we're up against an architecture of 2,000 years, like, or roughly speaking in my head, that it's, the architecture's been in place and a lot of the younger men artists I know are totally supportive of their artist partners and they don't like it anymore. Yeah. 
than you know we yeah. do. But there is a structure in place that. But there's a system. There's a system in place yeah. that is uh, like in the performing arts, Julia. Yeah. Okay. See, I don't see this as a male versus female thing on any level at all. Um, and well, I'm just going to throw out a couple more statistics and give you a couple of quotes because they're very revealing. So for the 2012-2013 um, ballet company seasons, these are all companies with budgets of over $5 million, of which a large proportion would be coming from some sort of government entity. Um, I'll name a few names. Uh, New York City Ballet, total works this season, 65. Works by women, zero. San Francisco Ballet, $38 million. Total works this season, 18. Works by women, zero. Boston Ballet, 12. Works by women, zero. Houston Ballet, oh, 15 works, three by women. And you know, it goes on and on. This is a list of about, I don't know, 15 or 20 companies. Um, 290 total works this season represented in the sample. Works by women, 25. Um, I mean, that's staggering. So there was a huge outcry in um, the UK when the Royal Ballet produced this Titian work that 15, um, 15 artists were hired to create works that would sort of represent the closure of the tenure of Monica Mason as artistic director. Um, I think it was a tenure tenor, 10 year tenure. And not one of them was men. And this was, you know, there was a huge outcry, so I just... None of them was women. I'm sorry, yeah. none of them was women. All of them were men. And there was a huge outcry, so she was asked about this, and I want to read her response. I have not commissioned any female choreographers to make work for the Royal Ballet during my tenure as director because, quite simply, I have not come across one that I felt was suitable. Choreography is not a gender issue. It is an issue of talent. <laughs> Well, and I thought, where is she looking? She needed a binder. But she, she needed, needed a binder. binder. But, but, <laughs> so why can't I not move this? Why can't I move that? There we go. OK, so there's one more quote, and then, I, then I'll, I'll leave you alone. But you know, the, in the ballet world, you know, I think it's women are the problem, honestly. Um, so in 2007, she's interviewed in the New York Times about um, uh, women's roles in ballet. And likewise, likewise, sorry, this is taking me a second, I will find it. She comes out with something that essentially, I'll just paraphrase, she basically says that um, women aren't really suited to this kind of work. It's more appropriate for them, they feel more comfortable in assisting roles. <laughs> this is 2007. This is an artistic director of an internationally recognized ballet company making statements that are absolutely appalling. And yet, no one, everyone is helpless to sort of do something about this. It's the enfant talib. It's the enfant. <laughs> they want the 23 year old young guy who will take a big risk and they'll say, well, if it didn't work, it's okay because he's it's young and genius. it's exciting. Yeah, and he's just, you know, we want to give him a chance. But the women just don't fall into that, that category in this particular world. But, um, you know, to me, the, the, the fundamental problem and the thing that I tried to change with this show that I curated was that I want to create camaraderie. You know, if somebody said to me, well, you need a cafe because I want women choreographers to get together and hang out and talk about their work because it would then create a different kind of culture around what we do. But because the competition is so fierce, because we are, you know, really feel rejected, I think we compete too strongly with each other. And so we, we, we see it as a zero-sum game. And we can't boost each other up. I have a, there's a person in the audience who's oh. really eager. Yes. So you have all those statistics you quoted earlier, about the small percentage of women's work. How many of those organizations have men positions of authority? The majority of them. Um, there were there were two or three that have women, and one of them is um, Houston, right? No, no, Cincinnati Ballet. They did twelve works. Seven of them were by women. So that's uh, that's true. But but you know, it's not women again. This is a whole other problem. Artistic directors of ballet companies, and that has a lot to do, I think, with funding. And because the men can schmooze, wine and dine all of the audience for ballet and the donors, but a woman in that role is a—it's a much more 
difficult position. It just doesn't seem to work as well. It's that's about raising money. I, you know, there are just so many layers of issues in the ballet world. Um, I mean, can, you can stretch that into like comp in, into conductors of orchestras yeah, yeah. too. I mean, you can't tell me that there isn't a woman that can stand up there and direct a, but, an orchestra. I mean, but, but I did just want to say, <laughs> I think the key thing is opportunity. They just, you just, opportunity. You just they just need representation. To, the work just needs to be chosen, and women don't need special workshops and hand holding. They just need the opportunity. If I walk into a ballet company like New York City Ballet and make a new work, you know what? No matter how bad a choreographer I am, it's not going to look too bad. You know, you know my, my odds are much better of doing a work that somebody's going to recognize as good. And if I'm a good choreographer, it'll probably be superb. But the fact is that if I'm working with dancers that I can afford to pay, I cannot compete. There is no way that my work will be seen as um, on the same par with the works that, for example, New York City Ballet is doing. And that's a purely financial issue. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I just wanted to speak to the, your comment about developing a cafe society for choreographers. That has been something women artists have talked about for a hundred years actively. In the Monroe article where the quotation came from that you used in your essay, she quotes a lot of women artists saying, I couldn't go to the bars. I didn't feel safe going here. I wanted to go there, but I didn't feel like I was allowed. But I also wanted to add to our discussion, um, uh, I was glad to see in your show that you had some uh, diversity in terms of race and sexuality because I think that if the situation is uh, bad for white women, it's even worse for women of color mm -hmm. and for women who are in any way engaging in any different kind of sexual activity or practice. Mm -hmm. And so I think that... Um, uh, I think that we we have a very narrow discussion. At least we're having it. Yeah. And it's important yeah. though to have that representation because if you don't have it in a show like yours, where will it happen? How will it connect up? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a there is a, um, a, a an artist in the in the exhibition who has gone through several physical transformations gone from a man to a female and so that was one of the um, things that one of the um, um, elements that I wanted to add to this to stir this thing up a little more that our, our, our typical ideas about what it means to be a woman, a woman artist, what does it mean to be a lady and there's, we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a world now where there's there should be an acceptance across the board, across the field that Genesis Breyer Porridge Briar can stand up against on the opposite wall as Nancy Gr Nancy Grossman, and they can have a conversation, and that conversation is good. Um, so, um, can I go ahead? Uh, just to follow up on what Julia was saying, I I do think it happens sometimes that you get women in positions where they see it as a zero sum game and are not supportive of other women, and I completely relate to what you're saying. I, I also think, um, just to generalize wildly, um, misogyny runs through the UK workplace like a low-grade fever, and you find many exceptions to the rule, and I, I'm sure there's misogyny in the US too, but I think that there's a, there's a very different culture. And I, I just wanted to bring that back around to um, Jason's initial question about um, what it is to be a lady. First of all, your email about how to be a lady went to my spam folder. I don't know if <laughs> Gmail thought it was dirty or something. Um, but I, I, I'm from the South originally. I don't still have an accent. But I was brought up in that sort of a cultural setting. And I've had it happen working in a major institution that I offered someone a cup of coffee because I believe in hospitality. And they immediately thought that I was like a college intern or something. Um, and it's really tricky. Uh, you see the sort of you know 80s archetype of a feminist who is dressed like a man with like a bow tie sort of thing and huge shoulder pads. And I, I think it's a this question of how to be a lady, of how how to um, whether whether that can be compatible with whatever our ideas of leadership and change and opportunity are, is really interesting. Yeah. 
Um, and I don't know if you see, if anyone on the panel sees any interesting models of how people have done that. Bernice, you had a comment about about that when, I, when we first started talking about this show and I told you the title and you said, well, I, so many, I, my mother, was it your mother that always said, you, you need, that's not ladylike, you need that's to be a lady. Like, yeah, I was brought up in the South also and yes, you had to, ladylike behavior was key. You know, yeah. I, I think I was, I was brought up to be a housewife. Uh -huh. You know, I didn't. I mean, the, I you're really happen. good at knitting. I'm really good at knitting. Really but good at knitting. I, you know, and I always had to wear white gloves. And my mother, white gloves, had to wear white gloves at church. Yeah, I'm not really Southern compared to you. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but, but totally. Right.